Pressure is building in Congress to stiffen U.S. oil sanctions on Iran and put more pressure on Tehran to end its nuclear program. Among the latest moves, the House Foreign Affairs Committee approved legislation that would cut Iran's remaining oil exports by two-thirds. That bill had 352 co-sponsors. But can tougher sanctions finally force a change in Iran, and which relies on oil exports for more than half of its government revenue? And what would they mean for world oil markets? Joining me are Sarah Vakshuri, a Washington consultant who previously worked for Iran's petroleum ministry, and Robert McNally, also a Washington consultant and a former energy advisor to President George W. Bush. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay. You know, the U.S. And, and the European Union have had oil sanctions on Iran for more than a year now, and yet uh, Tehran continues to work on its nuclear program. Some in Congress seem to think we're running out of time, the U.S., that is, is running out of time to, to finally act and stop this program. Uh, do you think that's the case, Robert? I do. Uh, it's really, we're almost 10 years into international efforts to stop Iran's quest for a nuclear weapons capability. And I think there's a sense that we are running out of time. That clearly explain, explains the extraordinary votes last week in Congress. When you have the Senate of the United States, which can't agree on much these days, vote 99 to 0 to back Israel if it attacks Iran unilaterally. That's remarkable at any uh, time, certainly now. And then in the House, the Foreign Relations Committee passed a bill with 351 co-sponsors that calls for removing a million barrels a day of Iran's oil from the market. These two extraordinary steps show that there's a sense that we're running to the we're running out of time to uh, stop Iran's quest for nuclear weapons. Well, Sarah, do you see that as well? And do you think uh, tougher sanctions could only stiffen Iran's resolve at this point? Well, there is a question in when we are choosing our strategic, uh, competitive strategy uh, toward Iran or any other country, you should have a very uh, significant and careful uh, calculations. And regarding Iran, the sanctions have been first, like since the revolution last more than 30 years, Iran was facing sanctions, not as much as it's facing since last year, particularly July 1st uh, of 2012, that uh, European Union stopped uh, purchasing Iranian oil. But now the more we are uh, going, stepping forward, the pain of sanction on Iran is not as great as it was last year. Really? So uh, last year, of course, because last year, uh, for the first time, Iranian oil was going to cut uh, to some certain degrees from the market. Both psychologically and practically was tough for Iran and trying to find different ways to circumvent it. From now on going ahead, of course, it's going to be painful. There's no one can deny that uh, Iran's economy is highly dependent on its oil revenue, but the pain is not as much as Iran felt it last year. However, we are not going, we shouldn't push it to, to the certain point. If we want to have a, uh, successful negotiations with Iranian or diplomacy with them that they completely lose the trust or provoke them to act crazy. Well, well, well by crazy, what do you mean by crazy? Uh, well, I, I believe that if we completely cut the Iranian oil market, Iranian are not going to sit quiet. And uh, having even a little bit of flow of oil from Iran is the greatest deterrence to, for keeping the Strait of Hormuz open, for the flow of, and security of supply from Persian Gulf. Uh, generally. Tomorrow we might see some pipeline blast in Saudi Arabia. We don't want this to happen. We don't want to increase the tension in the Persian Gulf. Some members of Congress seem to think that one reason that now is the time to, to toughen these sanctions is that the oil market is loosening up this year and that uh, Iran's oil, uh, oil could be lost and it wouldn't have much upward pressure on gasoline prices here at home. Is that a reasonable assumption? That would be uh, uh, a mistake, I think, for Congress to sell sanctions on that view. It's the right thing to do, in my view, because we're almost out of time and the consequences of failure are even worse uh, for the oil market and global peace. However, it's, it would be wrong to say the market's loosening up and we can do this without risk or higher energy prices. The most recent estimate of spare production capacity, sort of the safety cushion in the market, is about 2.7 million barrels a day. Iran exports between one and one and a half million barrels a day. So there's roughly half the spare capacity would be gone. According to EIA and IEA estimates, we may get up to three and a half million barrels a day by the end of the year. But that's where we were when we lost Libya. And when we lost Libya, prices went up $20, $25. So the market is tight. It may loosen in the future. It may not. But whether the market is loose or tight, the costs of letting Iran get nuclear weapons outweigh the potential costs of trying to stop them, including through sanctions, because sanctions might work. Um, and so it's worth the attempt. But I think what we ought to do, instead of selling the sanctions as being cost-free, we should use the strategic petroleum reserves as, if necessary. And folks like uh, SAFE and Nouri Roubini, who have written reports, sort of uh, 
arguing for sanctions now on the, on the view that the oil market is loose have also cautioned and said, you know, we have to be ready to use those strategic s stocks because the market still is fairly tight and it could put upper pressure on prices. How do we resolve this? I mean, is, oil, is the oil sanctions that big of an option here or not? As Robert mentioned, the spare capacity, the particularly OPEC spare capacity, historically is low. And uh, whenever the spare capacity is low in the market, it increases the panic in the market. The panic in the market increases the crisis in the oil paper market and it's going to increase the prices. Uh, we don't want to reach to the point that, and we should not forget that already the, particularly the OPEC members are covering for the one million uh, barrels of Iranian export, which already has been cut. So we need to keep some uh, in the event of any emergency, uh, whether it's a uh, weather emergency or if it's an unrest or a political emergency, to keep that. Regarding the, uh, the uh, strategic petroleum reserves of U.S., well, uh, this is, as of May 24, was 696 million, million barrels, which uh, with the current consumption of U.S. around above 90 million a barrel a day, will last 36 to 40 days for U.S. So this is really for the event of emergency. I don't think there's... You don't think it should be a tool here. I don't think it should be a tool, and I don't think there's any appetite for using that as a tool. Sarah and I agree on the tight spare production capacity, and uh, if any fearful event were to occur, uh, sanctions or a nuclear Iran or Israeli attack, prices will go up sharply. I think we see strategic reserves a little differently. The important number is 1.5 billion. That's how many uh, barrels are kept in the IEA countries. The U.S. has about half, 696, as Sarah said. Germany, Japan have the largest, uh, large uh, parts of the remaining countries. And so they would coordinate in the use there. And uh, we could, uh, if we wanted to spend the whole SPR, we could go offset Iran's a uh, million barrels a day uh, for over four years. One that we'll be continuing to watch closely. Robert McNally is with the Rapidon Group. Sarah Vakshuri is with SVB Energy International. Thank you very much. Up next, the U.S. is in the midst of not one, but two oil revolutions. That's according to a new book. We'll talk to the author next.